Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sarah Kelly and I'd like to welcome you to the National Museum of Australia. And before we begin the presentation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of uh, the land upon which we meet. Um, I'm the head of the registration section and as an introduction, I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of what registration does, does at the museum. I'll give you something nice to look at as well. That's the Springfield property. Um, collectively, we will talk for about half an hour and then there will be a, up to half an hour for questions. However, if there is something that you do not understand during the presentation, please feel free to interrupt, but be aware that the session has been recorded and filmed. So if you do ask a question during the session and after the session, you are being recorded. So by asking the question, you give your consent to be filmed. Um, and if I could ask everyone to turn their mobile phones off if they haven't already done so. Thank you. Um, the uh, registration department here comprises five teams made up of 23 full-time positions. Uh, these teams undertake a range of responsibilities related to the development, documentation, digitisation, storage, movements and transport of the museum's collections. They provide information on the physical and digital access to the collections. They are responsible for managing the National Historic Collection, the Museum Collection and the Archives Collection, which comprise over 230 objects of diverse types across four museum sites and through travelling exhibitions and outward loans, a range of external sites. We also have a team that manages the collection database and the digital assets system, providing user support and training for these tools. Of course, we are very much a part of a larger museum team and we work very closely with the conservation exhibitions and curatorial sections here at the museum. Uh, now, to start the presentation on the Springfield Collection, I'd like to introduce you to Patrick Bohm, who's the Associate Registrar for Exhibitions, Loans and Collection Storage. Um, now, this section manages uh, inward and outward loans, quarantine inspections, it participates in planning, developing new galleries and exhibitions, and coordinates the installation of objects and moves, tracks and stores the objects. So this is Patrick. Yeah. In 2004, the Maple Brown family offered the National Museum a collection of objects relating to life and wool production at the Springfield Homestead and Merino Stud. <coughs> Springfield is a large wool producing property in the Goulburn region and was home to the descendants of the original owners for 170 years. As you can see, there's a image of uh, a closer image of the homestead. The uh, the the Springfields um, Springfield's long as long as long connection with the Springfield homestead enabled preservation of many historical objects connected to the family and the Springfield property. In the 1950s, Bobby Faithful, a descendant of the of the original owners, began collecting personal objects of the past family and moved them into into disused rooms within the homestead, forming their own Springfield Muse Museum, which, in, which helped retain and preserve the family's story and, and the Springfield homestead history. And, uh, and as you can see, this, these uh, two windows here uh, uh, hold the, um, the Springfield Museum, the, the second floor of the older part of the homestead. Uh, the garage that you see there at the moment is is uh, part of our staging area for the for the pack up of the collection. We'll move on. The, it'll cycle through. You can see now an image of the Springfield Museum. <clears throat> Following the offer of donation, the museum began to receive Springfield began to prepare to receive the Springfield collections into store in Canberra. Project team, including senior staff from the museum's curatorial, conservation, and registration departments, was formed. At the time, the Springfield collection was estimated to contain over a thousand objects, and this this would be the largest collection of office, oh, collection of objects offered to the museum under the Australian government's cultural gifts program. A number of site visits 
to Springfield followed as the project team collected information about site access, availability of workspaces, and collection packing requirements in preparation for, for packing of the collections. Other considerations included staff transport to site, pest treatment requirements, and access to objects for values when the collections returned to Canberra. This is one of the initial uh, visits to, to site, um, our former director and some of the curatorial team. The museum's photographer also visited the homestead to document the Faithful Family Museum layout and homestead, homestead site. These images now form part of the museum's own Faithful Museum archival record. And many of the images included in today's presentation were sourced from this resource. <coughs> the project team went on to, to develop a detailed packing and transport plan, refining packing and, hand, packing and treatment requirements for the collection at Springfield and at the museum. A key component of the plan identified the need for handling and, and processing space uh, for, when the, for when the collections arrived at the museum uh, and with consideration for the processing space to be close to the museum's collection stores. A large container freezer was also identified as a requirement for pest treatment. Uh, it's uh, important for us to, to treat our collections uh, for pest activity as, as if they're brought into our, our collection storage areas um, with, uh, with pests that can infect other, other parts of the collection. Uh, the, <clears throat> the collection processing space uh, required storage for, for the Springfield collections, or the Springfield collections that were in process of being pro in, in the process of being um, documented. Uh, the space required air conditioning, uh, suitable for maintaining conditions, preserving the collection, security and fire alarm systems. Um, the large capacity freezer uh, was, was uh, also required. It, it was housed in, a, in another museum site. Here's one of the faithful family carriages. Some more objects from the site. Uh, the, the plan also called for a minimised approach to handling of the objects and uh, collections were, were packed down into small containers and then bulk packed onto pallets for, for transport back to, to Canberra. Uh, this uh, this minimised handling and, and also um, the risk of damage to, to the objects. Uh, during during its movement. In preparation for the uplift, standardised forms were developed for, for consistently recording uh, object information and labelling systems were devised for, for identifying um, treatment requirements and, and any other related handling issues. During packing, during packing, object details were recorded on the on the on a packing list. And a number of us, and a number was a, a uniquely sorry unique number was was assigned to the objects, identifying um, each object in the in the recorded list. Um, museum in, the museum used a labelling system for identifying objects that required fr freezer treatment, and uh, this took the form of a green label with the words freezer treatment on the on the label, and a red label for objects that were not did, that did not require treatment or should not have been put through the freezer. And this was applied to the external packaging of the of, of packed objects. Um, so objects objects that also objects that were sus suspected of to contain hazards um, like chemicals, for example, a, a medicine chest that was collected from the from the Springfield Museum uh, were identified with large hazard labels and, and uh, the handling team was, was notified of, of handling requirements for, the, for, this, with, for this type of material. Barcode labeling was also used to enable uh, efficient object tracking and each object was assigned a barcode number. The barcode number was also cross-referenced against the packing list for each object. 
Um, during, during packing, objects were also assigned to a broad collection groupings in an effort to streamline access and evaluation when, while objects were stored in, in Canberra. Uh, ob objects at, at the Springfield site, objects were bulk packed in, onto pallets and they were bulk packed under, um, within these groupings uh, to enable uh, isolated access. We could retrieve retrieve pallets based on their collection grouping. And some of the groupings uh, were textiles, photographs, books, household objects, and wool growing related material. <clears throat> uh, the NMA site packing teams included eight staff from, collection, from the collections management area. Uh, this included a mix of registration, conservation, and curatorial, curatorial departments. Two packing teams were, were identified on a roster system, and when not at, and when the second uh, packing team was not at Springfield, uh, they act as a shadow in Canberra, um, providing support for the Springfield team, and, and usually fielding requests for equipment and supplies and preparing these for for the following day's visit. We got to the end of the slides. Oh, good. Okay. Um, over an eight-day period, the packing team met each morning at the museum stores, then travelled to Springfield, Springfield for the day, returning to Canberra in the afternoon after spending a, a day um, solidly, solidly packing objects away into containers. Um, at Springfield, the, the, billiard, the billiard table room was, uh, was converted into a packing area and, and a hard surface was... A, was uh, was temporarily attached to the billiard table to provide a, a large work surface for packing collection material. Um, I get to, uh, later, more fragile objects were, were packed in the Faithful Museum and also um, adjacent rooms, uh, also uh, at the, close to the Faithful, Faithful Museum. Uh, these, these rooms are on the second floor. Uh, during the packing process, the teams recorded vital information about objects. This included any identif identifying characteristics, um, any hazards and pest activity, any identifiable pest activity. Uh, descriptive information uh, uh, enabling future identification during unpacking. And the control number was applied to the external external packing so that objects could be retrieved um, easily. Uh, the packing process included wrapping uh, objects in calico and then, uh, then they were shrouded in a polypropylene bag. In many cases the bags were, were, uh, had, an evac had a vacuum applied to them to, to make them collapse and, and pack tightly against some of the objects, the objects that required support. Um, these objects were then also packed into a hard Usually a polypropylene case, and foam foam padding was applied to between the between the voids of the object and the packing case to protect it during during travel. Uh, um, the museum uh, outsourced transport requirements for for the museum for the Springfield um, uplift, and a local local company provided uh, um, provided two provided two trucks, two delivery services from Springfield to Canberra, uh, bringing, bringing back to Canberra approximately 30 pallets of, of collection material. Yeah, so that, uh, that brings the collection material to Canberra. Material that was then uh, placed into storage, into climate control storage, and allowed to acclimatise uh, until, until we, the museum was ready for the next stage, which uh, which took, takes us on to the, the valuation and, and documentation process. And um, Anne is going to talk a bit about that. Anne Kelly. Thank you. Okay. Where's the... Could you have the white thing, please? Okay. Sorry, that's okay. Thanks, Patrick. Um, now I'd like to introduce... Anne Kelly, who uh, is the Assistant Registrar for Access and Archives, or Ac Archives and Access, I believe. Uh, Anne is part of the Documentation and Archives team 
uh, which manages material coming into the museum, documenting objects required for exhibitions and outward loan, and managing the cultural gifts program, donations and public access visits. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. I'm going to talk about documenting this collection. Uh, and here you can see some of the dresses as they were uh, hanging in the wardrobes in Springfield. Um, you might even be able to identify some of the ones that are currently on display. Um, the uh, one that's closest to us here in the Visions Theatre is the one we call the Pink Merino, which is in the left-hand side um, picture there in the middle. Uh, on its um, arrival, we documented this collection, and um, now I'll show you how it looks stored in the museum. So these are our shelves in the, in the museum repository. Uh, curators then research these collections and uh, with conservation bring you the objects um, in exhibitions. So see, these are some of the dresses you can see on display now. Um, when, a, when a collection arrives at the museum, we document it and uh, we ensure that each uh, object has a record on our database and this process we call receipting. Uh, we ensure each object has an incoming receipt number, a description, measurements and an image. That's the basic information. So we, I was uh, a member of the team that, who unpacked this wonderful collection uh, and here we have some of the dresses when we were unpacking them, measuring them, describing them and taking images of them. Um, if we look at them individually, on the right there we, I've added some of the descriptions. We had... Um, uh, some staff members with great expertise in this area, so the descriptions are quite detailed. This is one of the oldest dresses in the collection. It dates from about 1785. Um, and the next one uh, dates from about 1845, which is roughly when Mary Dean married uh, William Pitt Faithful. It has a lovely ro rosette on the back of it. And this last one is uh, a dress that dates from the 1880s. It's actually a, a skirt and bodice. And um, one of the images that Patrick showed you um, shows uh, Aunt Dean, as she was known, wearing that dress. So that's from the 1880s. I thought I'd also give you a glimpse of some of the bonnets in the collection. Once on our database, as Patrick mentioned, each object receives a unique barcode a, a number which when printed on a label, stored with the object and scanned to the location, means we can track the object throughout the museum. We can tell which building it's in, uh, in which aisle, what bay, what shelf, uh, and whether it's on display. Now why do we need all this information? Well first of all we need this information to ensure that our uh, acquisition documents are, are accurate. And also, in this case, we also needed the information because it was a cultural gifts donation. Now, the cultural gifts program um, encourages the donation of uh, culturally significant items from private collections to public institutions. Um, and in return, donors are, are eligible for a tax deduction. The uh, valuations are required to, to be done by two approved valuers, and then the submission is um, made to the um, Committee for the Taxation Incentives for the Arts. So, um, as Patrick mentioned, with Springfield, um, the, at, at the uplift stage, the um, incoming receipt numbers had been allocated to grouping, so we already had groups of objects so that they would tally with the, um, with the um, valuers who were being brought in. So we had one valuer who valued the whole collection, and then um, valuers with particular expertise in textiles or uh, the wool growing material, etc. Uh, so what did this mean for us, for our work at, at, um, in registration? Well, we had to pull together all those object listings for the different valuers. We had to coordinate their visits. Um, most of them came to the um, repository to look at the collection. Um, others uh, valued the collection based on the Im information we sent them and images. We had to compile the valuation reports and then um, prepare and deliver the submission to the committee. So in 2004, the 
collection arrived, as Patrick described. And in uh, 2005, we had a very busy year. Uh, the collection was receipted, uh, the valuations took place, the donation agreement was signed, it was approved by the Museum's Council. Uh, the collection numbers were allocated and the cultural gift donation was approved. So that was a very busy year. Uh, in 2006, we began the accessioning and I think we need to explain that the Springfield collection actually contains two collections. It, there's the Faithful Family collection, which has, um, which the number for that is 205005, and the Springfield Merino Stud collection, which is actually all the wool-related uh, material, which is 205030. So all the numbering of those collections begins with those two. Now, so in 2006, we moved on to um, accessioning. So the project uh, team finalised um, the acquisition by replacing the incoming receipt number um, with a new accession number, creating, um, we physically numbered each ob object and we created new accession records. Now, what does this physical numbering involve? Um, we have several methods of numbering objects. Uh, we have a cloth tag method where we uh, write the number onto a piece of cotton tape with an archival pen and we sew that to the items. And that's particularly for textiles and for leather. And if you're wondering what the little object there is on the right, it's actually a, a case for a thimble. Um, and one of the bonnets we saw earlier, that's its succession number. In. Um, then we have what we call the barrier layer method. And I just sh thought I'd show you this little teacup and saucer. Um, I will be talking a little bit about how you know, we, we talk about a thousand objects coming in, but we might we have many more records on our database. When this came in from Springfield, it was just one record on our database as a toy tea set. But with all the cups and saucers and the teapot and the sugar bowl and the milk jug, it ends up having 15 records on our database. So how do we accession number? objects like that. Well, we use this barrier layer method where we put a layer of um, B67, which is a, a clear uh, transparent um, inert substance. It's not nail varnish, but it might look like it, um, on the object. And then we write the number on it. And then we write it, put another layer on top of it. So all our, our objects are numbered like that. Then our paper objects. Um, Photographs, documents, books are all numbered in pencil. And that's a lovely portrait of uh, Pearl Faithful, who was the daughter of Monty Faithful, so a granddaughter of William Pitt Faithful and Mary Dean. And uh, the, on the back of that, in the lower right-hand corner, we have the accession number for that photograph. Now, to get an idea of our numbering, this is not a full number of all the objects, but we have about 4,000 records for this collection on the database, um, of which 500 are photographs. So if you imagine writing those numbers in the lower right-hand corner on 500 photographs, 250 books on the um, lower right-hand corner in the, of the back cover, we stitched 650 little pieces of tape onto different objects, and we numbered the paper items. So then we have well, then we had to um, look at storage, and one of my colleagues uh, measured all the uh, textile items, and we had quite a number of boxes uh, specially designed for each outfit. Um, that's a mourning outfit um, from the 1830s, and you can see that the skirt is stored in the lower part of the box, and there's a tray that fits over it, and the bodice uh, sits in that tray. Um, it's another dress that... I had to put in because it's my favourite object in the collection. It's the oldest dress in the collection. It dates from about the 1750s. Um, it's a beautiful green silk brocade dress and of course it's all hand stitched inside. It was remodelled probably uh, in the early 20th century when it was worn to um, um, a special event in Sydney. Right, we had to look at the storage of objects. So there's the little thimble case again and its thimble, and it uh, is stored in this um, box with lots of other little small objects. 
photographs, we measured all the photographs, calculated how many boxes we'd need, calculated how many mylar sleeves of certain sizes we'd need, and that's how our photographs and documents in the collection are stored. So, in conclusion, every object in the collection is described on our database and we can track its location. It's accessioned into the National Museum's collections and it's stored safely for future gener generations. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Anne. Um, now we're going to open up the session for questions. And for those that missed the, my introduction, if you just be aware that if you do ask a question, you are um, giving your consent to be recorded because this session has been recorded. And if you could wait for the microphone uh, before you ask your question and also speak clearly into the microphone and give your name when you start. Um, you can ask questions of Anne or Patrick about the Springfield Collection. Um, I'm happy to take questions about registration in general. So if we, if we could start, open up the question session. Over here. I'm wondering if amongst the items you've got, if, sorry, it's Anne Clifford. That's all right. <laughs> uh, whether there are any uh, records relating to people that worked on Springfield, or in fact in some of the photographs. Okay. Well, that's probably one you um, might. That we do have a few pho uh, photographs which record the staff on Springfield. They're usually group, group yeah. shots um, with the family. Uh, not a great number, but there are a few, and um, we do have a ledger which um, records the staff at a, during a certain period and what they received and what their payment was. Uh, I think there are other ledgers like that which are actually because the uh, Bobby Maple Brown also donated a large amount of material to the um, National Library, so the National Library also has a lot of uh, paper-based and material and books relating to the. Um, the reason I'm asking mm. is that in 1853, my two times great-grandparents arrived in Sydney and the next place we have them at is Springfield. Mm. So, um, yeah, I'm chasing family history, but yes. thank you. <laughs> I was just wondering if you ever use volunteer labour in any of this work, like friends or people who volunteer and get some basic training? We, look, generally we use trained staff for, for this sort of activity because it's a, it is a museum related activity and we, we, ha we need people who are trained. However, from time to time in, in the registration department we do have turn, internships and we have people on placement who can work with us under supervision on some of these projects. But you know, why, before objects become ours we tend to be very careful about um, you know, how that we, we use experienced people, especially when we're dealing with other people's objects. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. You, you probably realise there's a few grey-haired people here with various experiences and backgrounds, and I was just wondering, um, because probably a lot of us volunteer in what we think are very worthwhile um, pursuits, so I was just wondering if there was any avenue for that here. There, there are um, opportunities from time to time. It all depends on the project and on the material. Um, but it's certainly something that we do consider and people would be trained and under supervision and be given training in, in, in object handling or other techniques. So it is something that is considered. Could I just yeah. hop in here as well? Yeah. Um, if you'd like to contact our volunteers manager here at the National Museum, all the information is on our website or they can direct you down to the visitor information hub. We do have quite a few volunteers working in various ways through the museum. And we love our volunteers and we cherish them. And if you'd like to join us, please do. It's an important part of what we do. It's an important part of how we achieve the successes we achieve. Or you can talk to me at the end. Just yeah. thought it'd help. No, that's OK. I know people like to be involved with, with objects yeah. and having <coughs> objects because they it is, it is wonderful doing that sort of work and having that direct contact. Oh, now we've encouraged them. This will teach us. I would just like to ask, it's just such a wonderful collection. Would it po be possible to have an exhibition that features things from Springfield? You'd have enough, wouldn't you, for a lovely exhibition? You've probably been asked well, there this are before. A number of items are on display in the museum um, workshop. 
and also in some of the permanent galleries. Um, in regard to an exhibition, that's not that's an area that would have to be, you know, that that's a question for management and the exhibitions um, committee. Um, but it's certainly something that you know we can we can suggest to them. It'd be lovely if it could happen one day. Yes, thank yeah. you. I was just going to say that um, those dresses look in remarkable condition. Was there some conservation done to freshen them up, as it were? Mm. I think, Anne, you could... Um, conservation has, um, particularly when you saw those um, the dresses in the boxes, uh, they're all beautifully um, packed in those boxes with um, the special dacron and <coughs> pie silk um, sausages that are there to help them hold their shape. So. Um, the dresses that are on display have had more attention, um, but uh, all of them have been yeah. looked at and uh, cared for by our conservation yeah. section. But I believe they came to us in very good condition they did. too, didn't mm. they? Because they, they had been so well looked after right. by the family. Mm. Um, I, I was thinking about the capacity of the museum as a whole to store things. That seems to be a fairly comprehensive collection. Um, one would think that there might be other houses or other, other families around Australia who'd have a similar type of connect collection. Uh, firstly, you can't continue to keep storing every collection you're offered, I would think. Uh, so how do you choose what you accept and what you don't accept, given that there may be part <laughs> of a collection that's particularly um, important so, uh, yeah. for social history and another yeah. part that isn't? Look, um, with, with offers, we don't necessarily accept every offer of a collection because that, you know, we, that it, there is a committee that decides on, on um, the offers that are made and whether they'll be accepted or not. And there's a whole process around acquisitions. Um, so we wouldn't necessarily accept everything that's offered. But once we do, then we make a commitment to manage that material in an appropriate way. And, you know, storage is always an issue for every museum. So then we have to look at you know, extensions. And, you know. oh, I'm just going to make a couple of comments. It's Carol Cooper and I'm now a senior curator at the museum, but I was registrar when this collection came in. Carol Cooper, um, who started most of the photographs. Yeah, thank you, and I did star in a few of the photographs. But um, it, it is interesting. We were offered this collection at a magic time for us because we just had a review at the museum, the Carol Review, nothing to do with me. Uh, that was the, name of the surname of the man who did it. But um, it criticised the museum for not having a lot of... Um, because we came, I suppose, late, or the collections, we weren't a 19th century sort of state museum, not having a lot of um, uh, um, material from the 19th century and uh, colonial material. And so when we were offered the Springfield um, or the Faithful Family Museum especially as a cultural gift, it, it, it enabled us to collect um, in one go, so to speak, an enormous range of material that's been incredibly valuable and as some various people have mentioned we've got various of the dresses and other material there's a whole section in our landmarks exhibition on the Springfield um, uh, station but we also uh, yes we, so we're very lucky to to get that material in at that time and um, and be able to um, acquire it uh, in one go uh, and also what was very important was that we were able to plan for that and also obtain um, funding for extra staff, for example. And so to do all this massive amount of work that was done, we did have a project team um, who, who were able to work solely on that collection over a period of time. And as Patrick pointed out, we got a, whole, a, a new porter cabin, which we call the Springfield Cabin, actually. It still exists out at Mitchell, where we were able to um, keep that uh, area um, separate to just work on that collection. So a lot of things came together uh, to enable us to, to work on that collection and um, bring that material together in a way that wouldn't, you, you're right, uh, if we were offered like another homestead like that um, collection, something like that, we, it could be quite difficult. We mm. might have to approach, um, you know, get external funding. But at that time we were able to, to use, in fact, extra money that we were given by the government um, to really good effect. all the objects, but has anything been done about writing the story of the, the Springfields or the Faithfuls or, or documenting their story to go with it? Well, there's, 
Well, a couple of books have already been written some years ago by Peter Taylor on, on the Springfield homestead and also on Bobby Maple Brown. So, um, Carol. Well, even though we don't plan to have a, at, the, at this stage, to have a whole exhibition on the Springfield collection as such, we are planning a website which, in fact, will... Um, a lot of the photographs that you saw in the presentations were taken by our senior photographer, um, George Serres, and when he did that work, he took complete photographs in the round of the two-room museum. So we'll be able to recreate that museum, uh, walk through that museum, and you'll be able to click on objects and, and get all the information. So we're planning that work, which um, um, hopefully that curatorial and registration and conservation will be involved with. Um, so that will enable us to um, use a lot of the material that's already been uh, fortunately um, sort of uh, researched by this man, Peter Taylor, who actually spent a lot of time talking to Jim Maple Brown, the, one of the donor's um, mother, and she had a lot of the family history, but a lot of that was also uh, passed on to Jim's wife, Pamela, and so she's also um, knows a lot about the, the, um, you know, the oral history that goes with those collections. And I um, did initiate a project uh, to look at the, the actual oral history about the museum when it was in operation, because the, the museum was actually in operation for over 50 years, and a lot of people came to the museum when they were visiting, and the, um, the Maple Browns had little labels and things like that, so it's a fascinating uh, subject, and we will, uh, we do hope to bring this out a, as a website, um, which will make a lot of the collection more available just in one, one spot. How do you preserve timber furniture if it's cracked? How do you stop it deteriorating further? <laughs> I think it's more a question for the conservation people here. Um, but Patrick, do you have any um, yes, suggestions? We provide good storage, good stable storage for the, that type of material for, for our furniture collections. Mm. That yeah. does help to, to slow down changes in the timber. Yeah. If you, yeah. If you have um, a constant temperature and relative humidity, you can can stop that. Yeah. Three questions, just short. Uh, <laughs> first one: Do the Maple Browns still own Springfield? Two: Is it still a working property? And three: Is Springfield ever open to the public? Uh, the Maple Browns did sell the property a, a few years ago, um, so. I don't think it's open to the public, um, and they still, I don't, they still own a lot of property in that area, which they um, still use as a, for merinos. But um, I don't know what proportion of the property around the house was sold. Um, you said there's ledgers here, or a ledger, or some paperwork, and the, the photos. Is it possible? to have a look at them and how do you arrange it? It's a case of making an appointment to, to come in. And also, um, somebody I know, her granddaughter, has recently had her wedding reception at Springfield. Now, I think she knew the owners, but I'm not sure if that's perhaps one of the ideas for the house in the future. <laughs> so. I did see, I did see a, a comment in a, in a news article by Jim Michael Brown suggesting that it should be turned into some, some type of uh, resort or, or, or short stay um, uh, type of property. So I think the bride knew the owners. Mm. Um, Which is, and they offered to do it for her, but mm. it was just something that's happened recently. Mm. Uh, to do with the family history material, um, yes. We do have a process by which um, people can apply to look at objects in storage and we have a form that's filled in and we look at whether access to that object is possible. Um, all our photographs have been digitised and will be uploaded onto our database so they will be searchable yep. by the website. Um, the ledger I think is also going to be digitised so that it will be available. To, um, because if we had too many people coming to look for their Ooh, yes. ancestors in one ledger, you can imagine that means it's being retrieved too often and, and handled too often. So I think there will be a processes in place that you'll be able to look at those images. Mm. Within the next six months? Or? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah. 
Well, we hope we well we have a digitisation um, program starting yeah. up soon, so we're hoping <coughs> to digitise a lot of our paper material. Um, but uh, yes, it just depends on how quickly we can get that going, and we're still putting the resources together for that project. But it's it's on this year's plan. <laughs> yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, oh, a question from Heidi. <laughs> Just the uh, lady up the back. Um, every time I see the Springfield dresses, I'm struck by the vibrancy of the colour of them. They're just, they're beautiful things. And I encourage you all to go into Museum Workshop and have a look at um, the dresses that are being worked on at the moment. Is it unusual to receive clothing or fabric-based collection items in that kind of condition? Um, what I like to think of is that that collection was very well looked after. You know, I think those clothes were uh, treasured by the family and Mrs Dean, the mother of Mary Dean who married William Pitt Faithful, in her will she left her wearing apparel to her daughter Anne Dean. So those 18th century dresses and the early, the Regency dresses, they were obviously things that were treasured and they were looked after and I think when the collection came into the museum, um, it was mentioned, you know, the cold climate of Goulburn and good housekeeping and thick walls on the house, on the house, and just the, the fact that they they kept their house tidy and clean and checked the uh, checked the textiles off, and uh, I think that all helped to preserve them in the state that they're in. Mm. Anything else? It's just a comment though, but there are some delightful photos of young Maple Browns wearing these beautiful dresses which are on display at the moment and they did use them for dress ups and things like that as any family does, but they, mm. as Anne said, they put them back carefully in cupboards and the cupboards were locked and the, the old part of the house, where, as Patrick explained, where the museum was, was, um, was made out of stone and the walls are about two foot thick. and. It was amazing, there was very little dust or anything like that seemed to get in. There weren't, we talked to a lot about insects and pest management, but there weren't, for example, silverfish or um, things like that. Mm. So amazingly, uh, it was just one of those things where, again, as Patrick said, in the 1950s, um, Bobby, Bobby Faithful, before she became a Mabel, Maple Brown, got together and got all of the dresses that had just been put away in rooms over you know, a hundred years uh, in different rooms as people had died or left and um, she brought them into this two-room museum and um, and then they were sort of like, uh, you know, cared for there and they didn't move apart from these occasional um, romps outside on the veranda with um, with some of the young children. They didn't, um, you know, leave the museum, the Faithful Family Museum and then, of course, since they've been at the museum, I mean, um, Pamela Maple Brown says this lovely thing that she thinks that they must have felt that they had all died and gone to heaven when they came to the museum and they were all laid out in tissue in these beautiful boxes and things like that. So they've certainly had an enormous amount of work from the registration and conservation team since they've arrived. Okay. Any more? That's it. Um, look, I'd like to thank you very much all for coming along today and I, I encourage you to go into the uh, museum, uh, workshop, exhibition and permanent galleries where some of the objects are located and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your visit. Thank you very much. Yeah.